in 2013, I took my first ever screenwriting class. I was 36 years old. The first day of my class, I was terrified. I was at least a decade older than all of my classmates, and they all talked with this film slang that I didn't understand. The professor from my class was Tom Muska. He did this little film called Stand and Deliver. It was one of the classic films of my childhood. He was boisterous and charismatic, and he chided students for not paying attention to their characters and not fully committing to their stories. The first script that I wrote for that class was trash, because I had no idea what I was doing. But Muska saw something in me, and he encouraged me to keep at it. So I did. My life hasn't really been the same since that first screenwriting class. I've screened my films around the country, and this year for the first time, I was able to participate in the Sundance Film Festival as a Sundance Night Fellow. I'm a filmmaker now. Filmmaking is at the center of everything that I do. A little bit about making movies. Filmmaking is a collaborative effort. When you're working on a short film and you're on set, you're working for 12 to 14 hour days up to five days in a row. You're under immense pressure and stress. No one is eating, sleeping, or showering properly. You have to make a film that you're all proud of. It's a mammoth task, but at the end of the day, when you're sitting in a theater in front of an audience, it all feels worthwhile. You can't make a film without a dedicated crew. One of the most important lessons that I've learned is when you're making movies, sometimes it's those unexpected connections and those odd partnerships that are the best for the work that you're doing. The TA for that screenwriting class that I took was this guy named Barrett. He had a southern accent, and he wore red shoes. I'd once read somewhere that red shoes signaled confidence in a person. He loved the main character of my screenplay, and he really wanted to help me with my film. So after the class was over, I asked him if he would shoot my first film, and he obliged. We've been working together ever since. When I posted this photo on my Facebook page, my friends and family were intrigued and perplexed. How are we even friends? What is the nature of this relationship? I could literally sense the mushroom clouds going off in their heads. To be perfectly honest with you, we haven't quite figured it out. I'm 40 years old, I work full time, I'm a single mother. As a kid, I lived in a single wide trailer in one of the poorest counties in rural Alabama. Up until sixth grade, the only white people that I knew were either my teachers or people that I saw at the supermarket. Barrett grew up in Kentucky. He is 27 years old, and he is living his single life in LA. His parents were both doctors, and he spent most of his time hanging out with his fraternity brothers. Before he came to the University of Miami to do film, he was offered a job working on a Republican campaign, and he almost took it. So how are we even friends? I don't even know, to tell you the truth. Last year, I started production on my documentary film, Alabama Land. Alabama Land is a story about my grandfather. He's 95 years old, and he owns 688 acres of farmland in Alabama. This land was part of the original plantation that my ancestors worked on as slaves. In picking the crew for this film, I had to not only pick people out who were really good at what they did, but I also had to think about how they would fit in my family environment. Barrett was one of my top picks, but there are no white males in my intimate family spaces. So in doing the docu documentary, I was worried that his presence would throw off the family dynamic. On the contrary, Barrett proved to be one of the biggest assets on my film. As my director of photography, he was sensitive in his portrayal of my family members. He would sit on the porch with my granddad and they would talk about the weather and the world and the state of farming in Alabama. Here was this white Southerner, the type of person that black Southerners had learned to be suspicious of 
sitting on the porch with my grandfather, giving him his due. It was amazing to see. At times, my relatives were as open with him as they were with me because they saw him as an extension of myself. On set, our communication was seamless. Sometimes he would say, April, come over here, look at this shot, tell me if this is what you want. That's how he talks. And I would come over and look at the shot and I would pause for like a split second. And just in that pause, without me saying anything, he knew it wasn't what I wanted. And he would say, okay, hold on, hold on. I know what you want. I'm gonna fix it. I'm gonna make it right. And he would do it. On set plenty of times, we could communicate without speaking. I can't pretend that there haven't been bumps in the road. I can't pretend that we don't get on each other's nerves. I can't pretend that we haven't disappointed each other at some point in some way. But that's the nature of collaboration. That's the nature of the creative process. Barrett cut the trailer that you're going to see in the next few minutes. Whenever people watch this trailer, they always say to me, oh my gosh, it's the music, it's so great, it's so you. Or they say, oh my gosh, these shots are so great, they have your fingerprints all over them. And I directed it so it does have my fingerprints all over it, but at the same time, it has Barrett's fingerprints on it too. When I tell people Barrett selected the music that cuts to the core of how I feel about the place that I grew up, or when I tell people that he chose these shots that really align perfectly with my creative vision, people are floored. So I'm gonna show you the trailer now, and I just wanna say that this is the type of work that can happen when you layer diverse voices into your projects. This is the magic that can occur when you open yourself up a little bit to new, unusual, peculiar collaborations. Well, it was in my childhood day. Thirty-three thousand farms in Alabama. Forty-three thousand farms in Alabama. About twenty-eight hundred farms are black farms. And he got up in the uh, Sweet Home, Alabama. Wheel wheel. Uh, and he uh, crawled out. <laughs> One day I'm sitting on that porch with my grandma, and I said, "When I get famous, and people ask me where I'm from, I'm not going to say I'm from here." And she just looked at me and she said. I have no love for people who deny where they come from. If you deny where you come from, you're denying all the people who came before you. You're denying everything that made you what you are. And I have no respect for people who do that. The land came from the slave owner. That's just a part of us. That's a part of the Jones heritage, so we can't let it die. Now, his vision is, was to, to have it and to see it and to keep it. It's up to us how we care for that blessing. There's a stigma where you don't want to really discuss um, the passing of a, of a loved one. And I think that is more pervasive in the African-American community than others. She don't want to come at all. Pop, tell this man that's going to New York. <laughs> now all I want to move back. Glad to get me. That was these guys and the Ku Klux Klan was going to come get my dad. They're going to hang. We're ready. We're all expert shots. And can you imagine a 10 or 12 or 13 year old boy having to think about, okay, I'm going to kill these people. No amount of money in the world that, that you can give me to make me part with this land. I think people need to be optimistic. Like they need that. Like they need to feel like, oh yes, it'll go on and it'll be a farm and it'll keep going. But the reality of it is, no one wants to take on the burden of this life full time. Then every heart now with the Holy Ghost. There's no place like home. If I'm away more than two weeks, I just get an itch in my soul to come back and just, just to be at, be here on the farm. Be shouting, my God. I hear them still.